Hello, and welcome to Hedgehog Storytime, where I read my weird original fiction. The following story is part of the Mayhem Cerebrum Project, linked to the playlist in the description below. Yes, you have to read them all. No, that is not a request. I think some of you might be figuring some things out. I know at least one of you is figuring some things out. Uh, for the rest of you, it might take a little bit longer, but... Yeah. If if the last... If if Good Bitch was kind of for tone setting and, and the continuation of Edie Valley, this story is kind of the start of Mayhem Cerebrum in many different ways. So without further ado, here is Juno's Been Had. Part 2 It was raining by the time that Alex made it back to her hotel room, which meant that it was far darker than it should have been for this early in the evening. Her skin crawled oddly as she fumbled for the light switch. Even when the room was bathed in a harsh, yellow glow, the feeling didn't necessarily go away. She tried not to think about Trip and how she'd had to blow him off, but this whole thing was something she didn't even understand herself, let alone tell him about it. And besides, this was something that she may very well have helped to start, so she would have to end it herself. It was her responsibility. Wasn't this why she had joined the FBI in the first place? To gain the resources she needed to find him again? Alex felt bad about that, too. She hadn't lied to Andrew, exactly. Everything she'd said was true. But it wasn't the full story. Not by a long shot. Alex sighed as she surveyed the room that was strewn with various papers and documents. She hadn't organized them into a conspiracy board or anything like that, if only because it would be more effort than it was worth to set it up. Some of the papers were beginning to yellow from age. Most of these were printouts that Alex had gotten herself over the course of her initial investigation. There were several articles about the murder of Andrew's father— He'd been found alone in the trailer that he lived in with his son, stabbed several times in the chest and limbs. Officially, the incident had been classified as a random break-in, as the wounds were too deep to have been made by a 14-year-old boy, at least against a full-grown man, so Andrew had been merely marked as missing. But among these printouts were also some photos. Alex had gone to the trailer when she'd been 17. The Zengs didn't have any other relatives, so no one had touched it since the police investigation, which had been cursory at best and incompetent at worst. She hadn't gotten inside. The door had been locked, and she didn't have the guts to try to break in. But there were several blurry shots taken through the dusty windows and of the door. The inside was messy, sure, a little messed up on top of that. There had clearly been some sort of a struggle. But was there enough misplaced to assume a break-in? Maybe, but the thing that really made her wonder was the door. It was entirely intact, and there was no sign of forced entry save for some scratches around the keyhole, which, knowing the Elder Zeng's proclivities, were more likely caused by him than any intruder. At the time, that had been all she could do. It had raised a suspicion in her mind. But that was all. She couldn't come to any real conclusions or motivations, and she had no idea where Andrew had gone. Once she joined the FBI, however, that had all changed. It had taken a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of shitty coffee, but Alex had persevered. At first, she'd been extremely discouraged, as it seemed as if her old friend had simply disappeared entirely. But gradually, from what little documentation he'd left behind, a job here, an apartment there, and from contacting what few acquaintances he'd had, Alex had managed to piece together a picture of where he'd been these past ten years. The rest of the papers consisted of these documents, which she might not have acquired entirely legally, transcripts of interviews she conducted, and yet more newspaper articles. Andrew seemed to have made it a habit to disappear suddenly. Most people she talked to had described him as a polite young man, if a little distant, but nearly all of them had expressed confusion when he'd just up and vanished. Alex hadn't told any of them why he'd gone. She didn't want to ruin their impression of him. But attached to nearly every interview she had was a newspaper article. A break-in here, an assault there. Murder was the most common, all occurring right around the time Andrew disappeared again. Of course, Andrew couldn't be tied directly to any of them. The closest any of them got to a description of the assailant was Asian, which didn't mean anything, and usually there wasn't one at all. Like she'd told Tripp earlier, it was all purely circumstantial. There was absolutely no concrete proof that he'd committed all those crimes, or even a single one of them. 
Furthermore, he had no motive, at least not for all the diversity. He did share an acquaintance with a few of the victims, but not enough to constitute a pattern. And taking the boy she'd known and the man she'd spoken with earlier that day, he didn't read as someone capable of anything so extreme. But all of that was what conventional wisdom dictated. That was discounting an important witness account. Her own. That testimony would never be admissible in court. It had happened ten years ago, and she hadn't really been lying about that. Alex didn't necessarily remember what had happened that day. And of what she did remember, well, in no sane world could any of that be real. Which was why she had no idea what to think. Everything she knew and learned told her that Andrew couldn't be responsible for the mayhem that seemed to follow him. But what she felt was even if he couldn't, he just might be. It didn't really make sense even to her. She needed to ask Andrew. But by that same token, asking Andrew might be dangerous. For all she knew, he might not be Andrew at all anymore. Luckily... She had insurance. Almost everything she told Andrew had been a half-truth, except for one thing. It wasn't a coincidence that she'd run into him in the video store, and she hadn't been there for his boss. Obviously. Which led her to the very last document, one that was separated out from all the others, laid out on the bedside table. It was a missing persons report for one Andrei Kreminsky, filed four days ago by his daughter, Luckily for her, a lot of people went missing in the city, so the police hadn't been particularly quick on the draw with this one. Alex wouldn't admit that she'd been keeping an eye on the video store, or that she'd known for quite a while that Andrew was working there, but maybe she had. Just a little. She'd accomplished what she wanted to today. She'd made contact. Either Andrew had lied to her to hide the fact that his boss was missing, or he'd lied for some other reason, which meant further investigation was required. Her next goal was to fully scope out the video store. That would be hard to do without raising Andrew's suspicions, but she thought she'd done a good enough job dropping his guard today. However, it was still going to be a... delicate operation. If she could get concrete proof that Kraminsky was dead, then she might be able to convince him to start talking for real. Yet, if there was one thing she'd learned as a rookie FBI agent, it was that often the best laid plans got utterly screwed up. She was just about to find some place to eat, there was no point in sitting and stewing in this tiny room any longer than she needed to, when her phone rang. She almost ignored it. It was probably just Trip again, or maybe her boss. Odds were that she was not going to have a job after this. But then she saw an unknown number with the city's area code, and picked it up. Hello? This is Alex Cross. Alex? It's, uh, Andrew. Sorry to call so late. Oh, no, it's fine. She hitched her voice up a little. I just finished dinner, actually. It's just... He sounded hesitant. There's a lot of stuff I feel like we both want to talk about, but I don't think the video store is the best place to do it. You're probably right. Do you have a car? Let me give you the address to my place. Alex noted that it was located in a shitty neighborhood, right near the video store. Parking's really rough around here, but there's a parking garage a block down that's usually pretty empty. I can meet you there. Sounds like a plan. I'll be right over. Internally, her heart sank a little. Meet me at an empty parking garage after dark. If he wanted, it would be the perfect place to get rid of her. But he didn't know what she knew. And maybe his intentions really were good. Either way, she had to go, didn't she? She grabbed her sidearm, the standard Glock M19, just in case, whatever happened, whoever she met there, she was going to get some goddamn answers. She'd waited ten years, after all. Alex always felt a little uncomfortable in parking garages. Apparently it had something to do with liminal spaces, parking garages being locations that one mostly didn't spend a lot of time in. Alex thought that, personally, it was all the concrete. She didn't like the weight of it. How she could feel the pressing down around her. She had her pick of parking spots. Andrew had been right, the place was mostly empty. There was a few lonely cars here and there, though most of them looked like they'd been here a long time. Yeah... She really didn't like this. There was one thought that occasionally surfaced in her brain, 
It was one that, frankly, she didn't want to think about. What if there was nothing strange or somehow supernatural about this whole affair? What if Andrew was simply just responsible? Maybe something in that cave or something after had just broken him. Up till now it had been easier to believe in an alternate solution, but now that she was here, she had to face the fact that it was the most rational explanation. She kept her door locked as she reached for her phone to text him, but before she got very far, she caught movement out of the corner of her eye. Alex had to smile a little, despite the situation. After all of this time, the man still loved his gray hoodies. His hands were in his pockets as he padded softly across the concrete towards her. He just looked like a normal guy. His usual nearly apologetic look, which had only intensified with age, was so thoroughly Andrew that for a second she was sure there had to be some mistake. But Alex bit her lip. That was sentiment talking. The number one thing she learned in the academy was that you couldn't judge someone by appearance alone. You had to rely on the facts. Right now, there weren't a lot of those. And there was only one way to know for sure. She opened her door and stepped out of the car. Hi, she said. He smiled vaguely. Did you find the place okay? Uh Uh-huh. She nodded, shivering a little from all the concrete and the hollow way their voices echoed back at them. You were right, this place really is empty. I don't really know why, he admitted. Every other place is always slammed. Well, it is a little creepy. The wind whistled through the garage, which wasn't helping matters. You think so? He asked. I've always found it kind of comforting. With a jolt, Alex realized why she was finding this whole thing so disconcerting. Andrew standing there had solidified it. The hollow, yet empty feeling, the echoes of the rain falling outside, even the eerie chill. It was as if no time at all had passed, and the two of them were right back in that cave. It's a little... cold, she said lamely. Then let's head to my place he suggested, turning. Alex hesitated, for just a moment. "'What's the holdup?' he asked, as he realized that she wasn't following behind him. "'Let's go, Daisy Chain.' He froze as he heard the safety of Alex's pistol releasing. "'Alex,' he muttered, his back still to her. "'What are you doing?' It wasn't until that moment that Alex knew what she was doing— The gun now gripped in her shaking hand was pointed directly at his back. She had raised it instinctively as a visceral gut reaction. A reaction response to that phrase. Andrew has never called me that. What? Daisy Chain? I just think it's a nice nickname. No. That's a lie. She couldn't believe it. She was remembering. She was really remembering something now. Something she desperately didn't want to. There was... Down in that cave with us. Something. Andrew never called me that. Not even once. But that... That thing. Oops. The man she'd thought was Andrew sighed. I was sure I'd gotten better at imitating the kid, but I guess I screwed up, huh? He turned his head to look at her and smiled broadly. It was impossible. She was sure that that awful day was something she just invented, maybe to cover up something worse that had happened to her. So she tried her best to forget about the whole thing, but had it all really been... real? No, it couldn't be. Andrew was here, right in front of her. Hands where I can see them. She barked hoarsely, and he complied, turning to face her. Who are you? His expression twisted. You don't remember me? I'm hurt. And after we played such a fun game together. It was a split personality. It had to be. Maybe he developed it while they'd known each other. Maybe he'd had it all along and it had just happened to come out on that particular day. Because Andrew was still standing in front of her. It was still his face that was twisting into those unnatural expressions. He hadn't been replaced by someone else. Although, I guess I never told you my full name, did I? It sounds a little suspicious, I'll admit, but everyone's gonna have one, I guess, so if you'd like, you can call me Mr. Malum. Yes. He'd just been Mr. M back then, but that was the bastard. I thought I got rid of you, 
She played along, her finger not leaving that trigger. Our agreement, if I recall correctly, was that I gave Andrew his body back. We never said for how long. You piece of shit. Gee, your mouth's gotten fouler since back then. Oh, what a shame. You were such a precocious little tyke, but you just had to go and grow up, didn't you? Alex's vision was swimming. This couldn't be really happening. And yet, with each moment that passed, she found herself believing it just a little bit more. It was that smile. That same one that she was sure haunted her nightmares, even if she couldn't remember them. No, God, she had to get a grip. The man in front of her was just that, a flesh and blood mortal, just as she was. He was just very sick, and he needed her help. She owed him that. All she could do was detain him and hope that Andrew came back soon. I'm going to cuff you now, she told him, gripping onto the handcuffs that were in her sweatshirt pocket. Don't resist. A pitying expression crossed his face. Sorry, Daisy Chain, but you're not going to do that. She opened her mouth to retort, but before she could say anything, something impossible happened right before her eyes. Mr. Malum, Andrew, whoever he was, simply pointed his finger, but not at her. At her gun. Alex squeezed the trigger, but to her surprise, nothing happened. For a split second, she looked down and dropped the pistol. It was the dumbest thing she could have done. But what else was she supposed to do when it was staring back at her? She couldn't even pick it back up again because it scuttled away with a series of pitiful shrieks. By the time she recovered, Mr. Mallon was already halfway across the parking garage. I'd thank your lucky stars that I'm still not at my best. Would have turned it into a snake or something if I could. Alex gave chase. What else could she do? Her sneakers thundered across the concrete as she sprinted after him, but he had a sizable head start. He made it to the side of the concrete, right where the garage was butted up against an abandoned building of some kind. With no hesitation, he vaulted the embankment and flew through the broken window just ahead of them. Shit, she muttered. He was leading her into a more advantageous location. Now that her gun was gone, she was unarmed. At least, that's what he thought. But she was just as prepared as he was, and she was finally going to take this bastard down. She'd grown much more athletic over the last few years. She'd had to but that window might be even too far away for her to make it to, let alone Andrew, who is still slightly shorter than her. It was with a sinking heart she realized the increasing improbability of a realistic explanation for all of this. One would think that him turning her gun into a literal creature might have done it, but if there was one thing Alex was above all else, it was stubborn. The window was coming up now. If he'd made it, even if he wasn't quite human, she was going to have to try. If she didn't, she'd never catch him. Alex mounted the embankment and pushed off as hard as she could. She flew through the air towards the stained bricks of the abandoned building and barely managed to cling onto the windowsill that Andrew had soared through easily. Grunting, she pulled herself up and through, out of the rain and into the building beyond. Tumbling to the ground, she coughed as her abrupt entrance kicked up a cloud of dust around her. When she finally gathered herself and looked up, her gaze was greeted by rows upon rows of wooden desks. This place must have been a school at some point, though it had long since fallen into disuse. She stood and felt around in her pockets. Good. Everything was still there. At least she wasn't completely defenseless. I gotta say. A tinny voice blared suddenly, and Alex jumped. I didn't expect you to be this prepared. I was sure that I'd caught you off guard, but I guess the shoe's on the other foot now, huh? This school was just a backup plan, so well done. Alex swiveled wildly until she found the source of the sound. A speaker screwed into the ceiling. No. Wait. It used to be a speaker. Now the metal had been morphed into what looked like a set of lips. It ground horribly as it spat out every word. Let me guess. You were never after Andrew's boss, were you? She had to laugh at that. Whatever he was, he was still much less clever than he thought he was. I actually had you fooled, huh? You wouldn't have if I hadn't just seen your little meeting through the kids' memories. Her heart leapt briefly. So that was him. Unfortunately, yes. He sounded annoyed. Right now, the game they were playing was cat and mouse. Or maybe cat and cat was more accurate. Both were trying to hunt the other down. At the moment, it didn't matter whether he was Andrew or Mr. Malum. If he could do something like that to her gun, to what was looking to be nearly all of the speakers in the building, who knew what he could do to her? All she could do was keep him talking and hope that would distract him enough for her to get the jump on him. The school had two floors, so her best bet was to systematically go through both. Quietly as she could, she opened the door 
and stepped out into the locker-lined hallway. Is he still there? She asked. Andrew, I mean. Didn't you ask that last time? His voice was oddly stereophonic from all the odd directions it was coming from. The answer is still the same, though there's a lot less screaming this time. A lot of swearing and apologizing, though. It's frankly kind of annoying. She was clearing this floor pretty quickly, going from room to room. Each was a mess, and besides the voice of Mr. Malum crackling through the emptiness, eerily quiet. Discarded papers covered the floors, and her feet left visible marks in the dust. His would, too, but she hadn't seen anything yet. Alex couldn't believe that she found herself checking every surface for eyes that shouldn't be there, just in case he was watching her. So how long do you have until he comes back? What do you mean? She was turning the corner in the hallway now, halfway done with this floor and still nothing. Well, the way I see it, if you could stay in control all the time, I never would have met up with Andrew at all. You'd never let him out. And why would you? Alex could almost hear the scowl in his words. Like I said, I'm not at my best. Maybe that was why he hadn't done anything more. Maybe that was why Alex herself was still intact. If she drew this out, he might possibly get even weaker. You never answered my question. This classroom had some graffiti in it, spray paint on the chalkboard from some kids who had clearly used this building to get high, judging from all the stussies and 420s. She took a few tentative steps in to gauge all the angles. Oh, that's right. If I take it easy on the reality warping, I can do this all night, so don't think the kid's gonna wrestle back control like a knight in shining armor or something stupid like that. There's only monsters here. Shit. There went that notion. But wait. Did his voice sound... different just then? More... echoey? He was right down the hall. Her footprints were leading him right to her. But maybe she could use that to her advantage. Quietly as she could, Alex hopped up on a desk and leapfrogged from one to the other until she was right beside the door. She could hear his footsteps now, the converse rubber padding softly against the tile. Shoving her hand in her sweatshirt pocket, Alex held her breath, felt her heart pumping wildly in her chest, and waited. But as much as I would love to dance this tango with you the entire evening, the door opened. And Andrew, no, definitely not Andrew, sauntered in. Just like she predicted, he was following her footprints. I don't think it's going to last that long. You're right, she said, directly behind him now, and pulled the taser from her pocket. He had just enough time to turn, caught thoroughly off guard, before she jabbed it against his neck. Alex was terrified that it wouldn't work, that he'd just stare at her and laugh and say, Nice try, Daisy Chain! But regardless of whatever Mr. Malum really was, Andrew's body was merely human. It convulsed rapidly, and a burning smell singed Alex's nose before he abruptly collapsed, narrowly avoiding hitting his head on a desk on his way down. Without a second's hesitation, Alex had him handcuffed, and it was only after this was done that she let herself fall to the floor and suck in a few breaths of much-needed air. Now, she was just going to have to figure out how the hell she was going to haul him out of here before he woke up, and who knew how long that was going to be?